One of the big focus of the India delegation at the World Economic Forum at Davos is gender-led leadership, women-led development and leading that initiative and leading the Indian delegation here at Davos is Minister Smriti Irani, who's quite a hot favorite with all the WEF officials. She's always been wowing them with her interventions at different sessions. Minister Irani, thank you so much for joining us here in the snow. Yep. It's uh, cold and uh, it's interesting that uh, you've just launched the We Lead Lounge. You want to talk a bit about the effort that you're trying to make to make the Indian delegation have more women and put women at the center of a lot of conversations here at work. I think Prime Minister Modi's governance agenda had women at the center of it because there was an understanding that if growth is fueled, it will ensure inclusion. And one of the greatest successes of his inclusive growth agenda has been the, the female component of our economy. Um, it is, I think, a compliment to those who have made the lounge that we talk about the women who lead. But at the again, the center of it are various government initiatives, be it the housing initiative where four homes have been built across the country, where the condition that the Prime Minister has put is that either a woman has to be the sole owner or a joint, a co-owner of the houses that are built by the government. Now, Rahul, it is not only a capital asset that is created, uh -huh. but research has conclusively proved that when women own property, domestic violence against them in their family units decreases. So there is an overarching impact of uh, the growth story, which has inclusion at the center of it. The gender parity report that came out had India at 127 in the global ranking, a little better than 135 where we were previously, but still really We down. have actually uh, highlighted to WEF even last year uh -huh. how it uh, did not take into consideration many of firsts that have been seen by India with regards to women. For instance, we have 1.5 million women who are elected to office in our panchayats. Uh, in the political empowerment uh, segment when the gender gap index comes out they do not consider those 1.5 million women who are elected to office as being um, how do I say this important enough uh -huh. to be recognized as political leaders they do not take into consideration women who are elected to legislative assemblies they do not take into consideration women who are ministers in state governments mm -hmm. they do not take women into consideration who are a part of the council of ministers in the government of India uh, so um, this huge gap is something that we had taken up with WEF. WEF was uh, kind enough to say that yes, uh, because it's a first only in India uh -huh. and that is why there is a disbalanced view and they will do this uh, indeed in terms of reflection as to how to recognize this political potential that India has. In fact, now, uh, in the wake of WEF 2023, we come here after the passage of the 33% reservation for women uh, bill, which is again a first for any nation on this promenade. How do you see that impact politics in India, elections in India, and in the manner in which tickets will have to be distributed by parties? I think that uh, given that BJP has been the first political organization in the country which has institutionalized reservation within the organization and has borne fruit for us by ensuring that more and more females uh, in terms of leadership potential rise uh, from the grassroots. Uh, we see it in our organization at the national level and at the grassroots level. Uh, but at the same time, what happens when women are in administrative and constitutional positions? This spend... Uh, of the taxpayers' money is then directed to issues predominantly uh, of education, health, building uh, social infrastructure, ensuring livelihoods uh, at the grassroots. So given what happens when women are politically empowered, and again, from an SDG perspective, women doing well, serving the cause of larger communities, I think it's a win-win, not only for women, but also men, children alike. But you've seen in politics, one of the things that's often said is that women aren't electable or you can't get them to well, win if, easily. Well, if there is one woman that you've been speaking to <laughs> who became electable from one of the toughest political constituencies in the country, I think I humbly would like to submit that I'm point in case one of the examples that we become electable from some of the toughest 
demographies and political legacies of the country from the gender agenda ma'am i want to shift focus for a moment to the india agenda yes. and talk to you a bit about uh, how the indian government sees its position in wef as we walk down the promenade you've got the india engagement center right there there is cii maharashtra telangana tamil nadu it almost seems like india was more than the was i think that um today when people look at the indian experience what do they see in the wake of the pandemic we did not hold supply chains hostage mm-hmm. for geopolitical reasons we helped not only provide pharmacological support to our country men women and children but we did so for the world we innovated with a back to the wall uh, very frugally apart from that our successes with regards to space technology the depth of our digital engagement not only financially but also socially i think gives the world much to wonder about much to celebrate uh if you look at the promenade today mm-hmm. one of the prominent agendas here is not only renewable energy but also ai predominantly mm-hmm. the fact that india leads the ai alliance right now globally i think brings a huge cause for the world to converge especially towards india why because we are creating a consciousness and a conscientious use of ai the uh-huh. prime minister speaks about ai not only from the perspective of how it helps let's say manufacturing how it helps businesses but how can we leverage our educational potential better with ai but at the same time be responsible enough to ensure that ai products are watermarked No, so so I want you know I want to come source. to that because in the annual risks report that the World Economic Forum has come out with, uh, the misuse of artificial intelligence in an election context is cited as the number one global risk this year. And India is heading into elections. The Prime Minister has spoken about this publicly. How do you and the government see this? The Prime Minister has articulated his position on deep fakes, and when he was addressing the alliance, he spoke about the need to generate watermarks for AI products. But apart from that, I think. the indian engagement with regards to digitization of government services has helped us also take away um, those elements within the beneficiary segments that were squeezing at the indian treasury but as a part of a larger false premise the fact that in 10 years of modi's government we had close to 10 crore fake beneficiaries that uh, and and saved around 2 and 1/2 lakh crores of the indian treasuries i think that speaks volumes today when you look at our even our voter engagement to the election commission of india the fact that we have uh, identification digitally now uh-huh. assured of our voters so that uh, booth capturing are things of the past but uh, the fact that our democracy has digitally delivered on services for beneficiaries digitally delivered on democratic engagements between the election commission of india and the larger populace that is to go to vote and i think also the latest challenge that was thrown by the election commission for the naysayers yes. who uh, in the shadow of a loss of an assembly election tend to blame the evm um i think india has done much to make a solid case for how digitally our democracy has empowered our people ma'am you've been coming to the world economic forum for several years in different capacities how do you see the buzz around the india story change or evolve in the years that you've been coming here rahul i think that one of the conversations that you had with borge and i'd seen a splice of it uh, there are two things that were a part of concern especially in the risk report one was that our uh, global economies are getting more and more fragmented and fractured uh, if you look at the post pandemic uh, let's say health convergence of efforts uh-huh. they have now settled to uh, 2019 levels of engagement globally however india and look at how india expands uh, brics look at what we do with regards to the african uh, union with regards to the g20 we are now a very very resolute voice from the global south so we have globally i think ascertain a position for ourselves which says we work not only for the benefit of our citizens but for the global good as well you know there's a strong india presence at davos there's also a strong saudi presence at davos and you were ma'am in saudi arabia recently and i saw how in pakistan everyone had a meltdown about the kind of position uh, and respect that you'd been accorded it seems the first non muslim person to be allowed in some of those areas in makkah medina what did you make of a 
the kind of warmth between India and Saudi Arabia at this time and the kind of reaction that we saw after that. I think the Islamic world has shown much respect for Prime Minister Modi uh -huh. and what you saw in terms of respect accorded to the Indian delegation was just a part of that engagement. But why did the Indian delegation go? The Prime Minister speaks about Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas and Sabka Prayas. Our intention is uh, Hajj will start just when the elections will be at the anvil. Uh, preparations then will become logistically a nightmare for uh -huh. many a bureaucrats. Um, additionally, Every year we have 1.2 million Indians who go for Umrah uh -huh. to Saudi Arabia. And uh, there are logistical challenges which have to be met, diplomatic issues that need to be addressed. Uh, apart from the fact that you want to ensure that while we are propagating that more and more women become parts of those delegations. Uh, if you look at our Hajj numbers, 47% of those who went in 2023 were women. So while we are trying to facilitate the travel of women, while we are trying to ensure the safety and security of our citizens by deploying um, CAPF uh, personnel, and while for the first time Prime Minister has allowed us to leverage our uh, ecosystem in the health ministry, I think it's a, it's a collaborative attempt between six ministries and two nations for the greater good of a population which is 200 million plus. M much was also made on a different note of your bindi and your sari and the fact that you were in Mecca, Medina and especially in Pakistan. I didn't the go fact to Mecca. No, the fact that in Saudi Arabia. I did have the privilege of speaking to the deputy governor of, of Mecca who was kind enough to engage with us uh, at the instruction of the royal court. Um, but I think that we can, we have come to a pass and a time in our humanity, uh, in our democracy, where we can show respect for each other irrespective of our religious belief and uh, actually adhere to our own religious norms while fulfilling our administrative or uh, legislative duties. Because Prime Minister Modi's opponents find that quite difficult to square. The fact that the UAE Sheikh came and there was a road show in Ahmedabad, lots of people lining and both sides. And a gentleman sides. who rarely speaks. Yeah, and uh, coming out and being very part of the about So what do you make of Minister. that? The kind of response we're getting from the Gulf Arab states. I think that this is a compliment not only to the Prime Minister's diplomatic overtures, but most of the warmth and the relationship that he shares with global leaders. But to back it, um, I recall your interview with Borge, uh -huh. where he let slip, and maybe it's a Freudian <laughs> slip or otherwise, that he looks forward to inviting Prime Minister Modi in 25. So there is an acceptance of continuity of government under Prime Minister Modi's leadership. What is also fascinating is that when you look at it from a WEF perspective, there is also a desire for investments uh, to look at how much of your environment will be politically stable. So Prime Minister Modi today has become not just an individual, he's become a political ideology and in fact an economic movement, uh, not only in India but also Global South or for that matter in many other um, platforms where we've seen geopolitics take some very interesting turns. I what he's become symbolic of is patient reform. Uh -huh. What he's become symbolic of is ensuring that uh, reform helps percolate and creates more opportunities for people at large, financially or socially. So I, I just caught up on some news domestically uh -huh. about this lady from uh, an Adivasi hamlet who was very proudly showing off to the Prime Minister the model structure yes. of her entire village. When was the last time that a lady from a vulnerable tribe could speak to her Prime Minister and in fact, her voice was so overwhelming. The Prime Minister just had this very gentle smile while he heard her elaborately. So I think uh, the Modi magic is working not only in India, but globally. So you spoke of the 2024 elections. You are sensing the inevitability of the BJP coming Am I the only one power. sensing it? Uh, the Rahul Gandhi, on the other hand, has just started this Bharat Nyaya Yatra from Manipur to Maharashtra. How do you see uh, the India alliance at this moment and how do you rate their chances against the BJP? I think that uh, the fact that Adir Anjan Chaudhary was articulate enough to say that they cannot uh, fight the Modi magic. I think the fact that Mr. Tharoor uh, accepts that we will in the BJP be the single largest party. I think the fact that after the overwhelming defeat of the Congress party and the Indian Alliance in the recent assembly elections. The writing is on the wall 
So while they march for dynasty, Modi marches ahead globally for prosperity for all. Do you sense the prospects of a bigger victory or do you think given that there is 10 years of anti-incumbency now or pro-incumbency or 10 years well, of governments which will be I'm not a political judged. pandit, Rahul. Mm-hmm. I'm just a simple Indian housewife. I can only say That's this. That's hardly the case. <laughs> I'll only say, no, no, all it takes is a housewife with a mind of her own to go to a meeting and win an election. But I also feel that, like I said, Modi has gone beyond political tutelage or political analysis he's genuinely become a movement and an ideology for people um if and you've been a witness to it yourself as a journalist people don't look at him from a perspective of an office people don't look at him from a perspective of a political prism they genuinely um in uh, for the lack of a better word uh, he's genuinely become a part of their families There's and that's very difficult in india to rip apart a family there is some talk so when prime minister says mere parivar jana he really means it because that's the kind of love and that is the kind of support he sees in in india there is some talk now of priyanka gandhi vadra potentially contesting from up whether it's rai bareilly or amit no idea what, what, what do you make of the prospect of this potential no clash i think that what is significant politically and i say so this personally because i don't speak for my party on this uh, i'm not the official spokesperson on this issue but what is interesting is that she has been bereft of any political responsibility mm-hmm. in her organization after being responsible for uttar pradesh in the assembly elections now when victory is definite nobody shies away from a responsible position uh, the fact that uh, they have been now um devoid of that responsibility means that they will also be uh, denied the blame for the um, i think momentous loss that awaits the congress party so finally what is davos for you is it one meeting one meeting one meeting or do you also get to go out i mean you've been out and about just for the interview to get to see the side lights as well just a bit no you don't get when you're working for modi <laughs> you come, don't get to do anything president. you just have uh, a work focus and nothing else and so, then you pack your bags and go back home really narayan murthy so said I, you have to work 70 hours i'm sure your schedule is stretched well, much more beyond well somebody who works 18 hours a day i can only supplement what mr murthy says but i do recognize that there is a segment in our populace which says that everything is not about uh, pursuing work but we are a country hungry for success and the prime minister speaks of 2047 and what a developed nation as a national agenda means well then mr murthy uh, more power to you <laughs> thank you very much ma'am for taking our time we have a whole group of officials waiting for you lots of meetings as you said all work and no play back to back so we wish you all the that's best that's the modi way yeah that's the modi <laughs> way thank you very much thank for joining you. us thank you thank, thank you for you the conversation thank you